All right, guys, before we begin tonight, if we could just all rise for prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for letting us gather here tonight. I thank you for letting us all be here and blessing us this past week with VBS and all the other activities that we have done, Lord. I ask you to please bless this evening, the sermon, that all that I say may come from you, Lord, that I may be a messenger from you, Lord. I ask you to please bless this evening and all of us here. Amen. Thank you all, guys. Welcome in. Uh, a lot of new faces today. Encouraging to see. I uh, welcome you guys to Second Slavic as a uh, native here, if we can say that. So uh, welcome in. Now, today I'm going to start with something that I'm sure we all have in our lives, right? So I'm sure that every single one of us has some sort of goal or ambition, something, something that they're trying to achieve in their life. Now, there could be many different examples, examples of this. It could be from career goals in terms of education. Maybe you're trying to get a uh, master's or a bachelor's or, or PhD even. Whatever it may be, you are striving towards a goal and the, your ambition is driving you. Now, you could also have different goals. Maybe they'd be physical. A lot of the guys, summer has already, already came up, but a lot of us try to get in shape for the summer and so on and so forth. Maybe you're already trying to get into shape for next summer. You know, it's never too late to start, never too early to start. So whatever you're trying to do, you're always striving towards something. You're always trying to achieve something, and something is always driving you to do it. Now, um, so this, all of these goals and ambitions are good in nature. It's something that we should be doing. It leads us to living a healthier lifestyle and maybe being more successful in our lives. But ultimately, what are we trying to accomplish with our goals or our ambitions? Ultimately, we are trying to be successful in our lives. We are trying to um, have some sort of achievement, something that we can back ourselves up with, kind of um, really back, back us up as to who we are. And everybody has their own definitions of success. Maybe for somebody it's material, it is some, maybe it's a new car, a, a job, a house, whatever it may be, it's something that it's tangible, that they're trying to buy with money. Um, for others, it may be relationships. Maybe you think that being in a relationship with someone will make you happy or having a relationship with some friends or family, maybe that's the key to success. And ultimately, as we look again and again as to, as to all of these um, goals, education, career, physical, material object, objects, relationships, at its core, we are trying to make ourselves happy. At, our, at its core, we're trying to pl uh, please our innate human nature to be content with life, to be happy with where we are, and to really just be happy in life. That's really the ultimate goal of every human being. I mean, sure, we all want to be you know, rich and successful, have this or that, but when you look at the rich people who seemingly have everything, a lot of times they commit suicide. We find out that they're on drugs, they're depressed. We, all, we hear about celebrities dying, committing suicide all the time. And to us, it's, it seems wild. We mean, they have everything that we could ever dream of, and yet they are unhappy with their lives. So today, I want to ask you guys, um, where do you seek your fulfillment? What is your life filled with, and what are you trying to accomplish? Why are you here, and why do you do what you do? Ultimately, what are you doing with your life to make yourself happy? Because innately, that is what it's every human is trying to do. They want to make themselves happy. So what are you doing to try to fulfill this? So what? So what, what can fulfill this void for us? Or who can? Well, I'm glad you guys are asking, or you're being forced to ask. So let's all turn to Psalm 16. That is going to be the psalm we're going to be discussing today. Again, Psalm 16, verse 1. And um, the answer is going to be fairly obvious. Um, so again, who can fulfill our void? So again, Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, 
or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, I want you guys to take note as to who wrote this psalm. This psalm was written by King David. Uh, we don't know exactly when or under what circumstances, but it is evident that some sort of tribulation or trial that he was going through. And he was, once again, reaffirming, reaching out to God, establishing that only God can provide to him the joy, the security, and the, f- the fullness of joy, and that only he can provide him the pleasure in life. Because everything else fades away. Everything else is temporary and, and, um, and cannot pr- uh, provide eternal joy. So, again, uh, another, thing, another thing to know is that King David is a king. So, obviously, material-wise, he, could have, he did have whatever he want, or he, could acqu- he had the means to acquire whatever he want. Whatever we're talking in terms of items, kingdoms, lands, um, even in terms of woman, you know, he had everything that he wanted. And yes, that caused him to sin. But once again, David had everything that he could possibly want on earth as a king. And yet, where did he find joy? So in verse 1 and 2, um, David establishes God as the only good thing, the only thing that could fulfill him. If I could get uh, verse 1 and 2 on the screen. So in verse 1 and 2, um, again, he establishes the only God, only God can bring his him refuge. And this might seem uh, a little ridiculous. You know, a king who is the refuge, you know, the people of the land, when they are attacked or something's going on, they look to their king for salvation, for protection. And yet here it is, the king, who is very successful military leader, and he is saying, God, you are my refuge. In other words, he is humbling himself and establishing the fact that only God can protect him and fulfill him. Um, in verses 3 and 4, David uh, discusses the people of the land. In verse 3, he uh, praises those who live excellently in, in the eyes of the Lord. And in 4, he, um, he con- uh, condemns those who choose worldly things uh, and saying that they will not only not succeed but also suffer. Um, I'm, this translation, translation uh, has an easier word, but I was re- reading a different uh, translation. And they had the drink offerings. So not only, so right there in the verse 4, when it says, their drink offerings of blood, I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. That means is that he will not worship any other. And not only will he not do it, he won't be present. You know, a lot of times in our lives, we try to kind of play this, this middle ground, kind of, uh, you know, I, maybe, I won't do it to the extent, but I'll be there right there on that middle ground. So it doesn't count that I'm not doing it. But, um, you know, so basically we try to get in that middle ground where we're not sinning, but we're not exactly doing the correct thing. And that gets very blurry and could definitely lead to sin. Now, David here draws a clear line and says that I will not even touch it. I will not pour it out. I will not even say it out loud because I do not want to be associated or let my mind associate that with me at all. So again, David takes a complete and clear step back from sin. Um, in verse 5, it says, uh, again, it kind of repeats what he says in verse 2, where he reaffirms Christ as his soul provider. And in verse 6, David discusses how he is pleased to, uh, to serve the Lord and follow his commandments. Now, I, th- I wanted to pay spe- special attention to this verse, where he says, the, fo- the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Oftentimes in our Christian lives, especially for those who grew up as, uh, as Christian kids and speaking from experience and from my memories as a child, I was always, in a way, jealous of the kids who weren't Christian. You know, on Sundays, they can do the fun stuff, but, you know, nine-year-old me had to be here on Sunday morning. And for me, I was personally jealous of all the other kid- kids at school for that, you know. I wanted to have another day off and do whatever I wanted, but... As a kid, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I was dragged to church, and maybe that worked out in the end, all under to God's grace. But regardless, um, we, as we grow up as Christian kids, we see Christianity as a set of rules that prevents us from having fun. We, we associate Christianity with the boring, the mundane, the stuff that's preventing us from having all that fun of the world and going out and uh, living the fun life. But God's word is not that. And this is, this is what David is saying in this verse. He is saying that God's law and what he wants us to do is beautiful, and he's praising, praising it. So 
to be eternally happy, we would want to serve and accomplish God. So what, I'm, what am I trying to say with this verse right here? So a lot of times we see Christianity as a set of rules that prevents us from having fun, when in contrary, we should see Christianity as something that opens the door for us to live a successful godly life. Now another thing that I would want to know is in terms of seeking um, eternal or satisfaction or joy is earlier I mentioned like all the other things that we can seek that provide, may provide us um, some sort of satisfaction, happiness in life, whether that be material things or relationships, but those are, as a rule of thumb, always temporary, you know? Any relationship eventually ends, whether it be at death or from other, other, other reason, or any material object goes out of style, out of favor, and suddenly you want more and more and more because everything that we seek validation in is temporary, temporary. But here we have God who is eternal. And because he is eternal, he can provide us eternal fulfillment. So once again, God is eternal, and therefore he is the only thing that, that can provide us eternal fulfillment. Now as we go deeper, or I should say on into verse 7, uh, David was once again, he is genuinely pleased to praise God. He says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and the nights also my heart instructs me. So once again, he is pleased to serve God, not just uh, like often as we would show up or maybe we'd sing and kind of get it out the way or we're here just for fellowship and we kind of just, you know, come mumble the songs and get out of here. Um, David is not doing that. He is eager and he is happy to serve God. And then in the second part of the verse, verse where it says, in the night the heart also instructs me, that is talking about the self-reflection that occurs. Now, Specifically, I think a uh, good self-reflection to, for each and every one of us to go through is, are we trying to please God or are we trying not to anger God? Um, a lot of us, I know as being raised in a Christian family, we were raised in somewhat of a fear, you know, like, don't do that or you'll end up in hell or something like that. So a lot of times we do stuff out of fear of the Lord, which is good. We should fear the Lord. But again, we are more scared of not angering God than we are with pleasing God. Now, what is pleasing God? So what is pleasing to God is a genuine relationship with him that is full of constant growth where we desire to serve him and it, through which we can achieve fulfillment and the joy that God will give us. And that's pleasing God. Now, not angering God is trying to fly under the radar, um, being annoyed at the rules set forth by God. And we see God as a hindrance to our fun and better life. So again, we try to not anger God, and, in a, and because of that, we start to build resentment towards him. Now, the main difference between these two things uh, regarding our happiness is that if you live a life pleasing to God, that will bring fulfillment to you. If you live a life where you're trying not to anger God, there will be no fulfillment. And if there is no fulfillment in your heart, you're obviously going to get discontent and want to leave the faith. And we see that all the time where people grow up and they're like, you know what, I was, I was a Christian my entire childhood, but this is, this is so annoying, I just want to get rid of it, I'm going to go do my own thing. And they leave because they were trying not to anger God versus actually trying to please God. So again, I encourage you guys all to always try to please God and not anger him. Now, in verse 8, um, David goes on to say, I have set the Lord always before me because he is my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Again, this David is um, putting forth the benefits of being in a relationship with God and being fulfilled in Christ. Because when you are fulfilled in Christ, you are steadfast, you are confident, you are, you are at comfort, and you're at peace. All of these things bring fulfillment, and fulfillment brings these things. It's a, it's a two-way relationship where you can't have one without the other. If you can be confident in Christ and comfortable in Christ and at peace with Christ, you are not scared of anything that you may encounter because you know that God is with you and God is for you. And if we, are truly, if we truly believe in this and we are steadfast in this, we will have a sense of peace and fulfillment in our lives. So once again, in verse 8, David establishes the benefits of uh, turning to Christ. Now, in verse 9 and 10, um, David gives God complete control about being sure in his success. So it says, Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. So again, here it is. Um, David is kind of giving up control to God and saying, With you, everything is perfect. You know, um, 
My whole being rejoices, my flesh dwells secure. It is confidence in Christ that is steadfast in our faith and confidence, steadfast, and peace. That is what will bring fulfillment to your Christian life. Not seeing Christianity as a set of rules that, you're tr- that are hindering you, but as a thing that is, um, on the contrary, letting you live a more godly life, a more pleasing life to God. Now, verse 11 really can summarize what, all that I've been saying this entire time, but um, this is what it says. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Again, kind of a summary as to what we just discussed. Um, But David is once again kind of putting an end or a period to what he just said and says, you make me known to the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. So fullness of joy is fulfillment in your life. That is our innate human craving to to be full of joy or to be fulfilled. Now, I haven't really said anything new to you guys today. Uh, you know, we have, so we have point one, you know, all humans seek fulfillment in their lives. And we have point two, you know, Christ is the only eternal fulfillment, sure. But a lot of us stop there, you know. We know one thing, we know the other, you know. I've heard, it, I've heard that God fulfills me, you know, that's, he's important. Um, but where do you go from there? A lot of us just, we acknowledge this, but we don't actually understand or we don't take action upon the second statement. So if God is the only eternal fulfillment, then nothing else matters. So why do we live a life that is completely focused on all the wrong things and not on Christ? If Christ is the only thing, um, if you open to John 6, 35, if Jesus is our bread and our water and he quenches our thirst and our hunger, why do we go to other places seeking that validation and that fulfillment if Christ is the only eternal fulfillment? So if we know the correct answer, why do we go looking at the wrong stuff? That is what I'm trying to say here. So why? So then again, why, if we know that God is the only eternal fulfillment, why do we go into the world? Maybe it's because of 1 John 2, 15 and 17. Maybe we are in love with the world. Maybe we like the worldly things. Maybe they satisfy our sinful cravings, our lustful desires. Maybe that's what we want to do. We want to get out into the sin. Um, I would like to open up now to Ecclesiastes 2.11 and uh, as to what the, um, the negative results can be of living a life um, that is of the world and pursuing the world. So Ecclesiastes 2.11. Then considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expanded in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So, yeah, we may be in love with the world. We may want to accomplish certain things in it, achieve, receive. But at the end of the day, as said here, it is completely and utterly useless. Whatever we are doing now is going to be completely useless, essentially, in 100 years. Unless it is our relationship with Christ, all the material things that we receive, we buy, we get, it's all useless, you know. And that's what um, this verse is saying. So not only is this world sinful, it is meaningless. So, again, I want to say that if only, only Christ can give eternal meaning to our lives, and therefore, and therefore only he, as the only eternal one, can fulfill us. So Christ is the only eternal thing, or eternal, God is the only eternal so therefore, only he can provide eternal fulfillment to our lives. Not all of the things of the earth that fade away uh, and that uh, eventually die under the sun, as Ecclesiastes 2.11 says. Now, if we can just turn to Ecclesiastes 12.1, um, that's going to be the next place. Um, so why wait? So we know that we want to be happy in life. We want to achieve some sort of joy. We want to achieve fulfillment in our lives. Um, we know that God provides it, so why do we, why do we wait? Why do we try to um, do all the fun things, all the bad things, and expect to be able to come to Christ later? Uh, a lot of times I've heard from you know, fellow people at school or other ones that 
you know, like, yeah, Christianity, yeah, I understand, yeah, I believe in God, but I'm going to go do all my fun stuff, I'm going to go do all the sins, all that stuff, and then I'm going to older, like when I'm 40-ish, you know, 50, I'll repent, you know, I'll, I'll become a good Christian, and I'll, I'll do whatever I need to, and then you know, I'll die, and I'll be saved, and I'll have a fun life, and I will, you know, I'll be a Christian, and I'll be saved. Guys, this is a completely incorrect way of thinking. You cannot count on being able to repent later. The time to repent is now. And Ecclesiastes 12.1, it says, Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Now, this entire last chapter of Ecclesiastes talks about the fading time, the limited time we have on earth, and how you should act. And I encourage all of you guys to read it at home at a later time. But specifically, I want to focus on verse 1, where it says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth. That means that we need to serve God now. And if you are hearing this, if you are perfectly aware of this, and you choose not to, you are purposefully choosing to go against God. That is not something that a saved Christian would do. And if you are an unsaved Christian or you are unsaved, then what's stopping you? Is it maybe guilt or is it the earthly pleasures? Maybe you want to, as I said earlier, kind of go and have your fun. Or what if it's guilt? Uh, a lot of times when we have live a sinful life or we have some sin in our lives, we think, you know what? I'm going to fix myself up. I'm going to cleanse myself. I'm going to become holy. Um, then I'll come to Christ. He'll accept me. It's going to be good. We're going to, it's going to be a great time. But that is, again, completely incorrect. You cannot be holy without God. So, so you cannot think that you need to be holy to come to God because the only way to become holy is through God. So, and this is the trap the devil sets for us. And so we are stuck in this ever-repeating cycle where you sin, and then you're like, oh, shoot. Um, I need to become holy, and then I'll come to Christ. And then you sit again, and this cycle repeats, repeats, and you never actually end up going to Christ. But this completely contradicts the gospel, where the gospel says that God loves us first, and therefore we, um, he loves us as sinners. God is who makes us holy, so we come to Christ as sinners in our sin, at our worst, and he will make us holy. So do not let the devil or any of part of the world tell you that you need to wait. Do not, do not think that, I'll fix my life, I'll get it together, and I'll come to Christ. No, you come to Christ first, and then you go ironing out the stuff that's going on in your life. So, at the end of the day, I really just want to ask you guys this. Do you wish to have a fulfilled life in Christ? Um, if the answer is no, why are you here? If you do not wish to have a fulfilled Christ, a, ful a fulfilled life with Christ, then uh, why are you here on earth? Are you just here to have fun? Does it really bring you true fulfillment? I want you to reflect on the, the time in your life where you lived without Christ, where you did. You did go out and you had fun, and you did one thing or another with your friends. And I want you to think, yeah, it brought you short-term happiness. You were happy in the moment while you were doing it. But when you came home at the end of the day, and you went to bed, and you were laying there staring at the ceiling, were you truly happy with where you are in life and with who you are before God? Now, if the answer to that question of do you wish to have a fulfilled life is yes, then call on to God. I mean, we can quote John 3.16 here where um, it encourages us to call out to God because everyone who calls on to God will be saved. For God is the only one who can save us and is therefore the only one who can fulfill us. So to kind of sum it, to, to sum it all up, all that I was trying to say today, guys, is that we must seek fulfillment only in Christ because only Christ can fulfill us. All the things of the earth will fade and will pass away, and we must, therefore, we must seek to the only thing that will never change, that will never grow away, the only eternal thing, which is God. So I encourage all of you guys to call on to God, to reach out to God, and to make sure that you are living a fulfilled life in Christ, that you may serve the Lord for the rest of your days. Amen. Let's get up and pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for letting us gather here, Lord. I thank you for letting me do this on stage and being with me, Lord. I ask you to please um, bless this, everybody here tonight and make sure that they answer this question to themselves. Are they fulfilled in you, Lord? I ask you to make sure that every single one of these people, they think 
and they only reach out to you for fulfillment. For everything else in this world cannot provide it, Lord. I ask you to please bless each and every one of us as we think about this on our way home. Maybe it's tonight, Lord. I ask you to please uh, bless each and every one of us um, on our way homes. And may everything be in your holy name. And may, may we live our life fulfilled to fulfill your glory. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.